Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back listeners. Thank you so much for giving us some of your time. I think you're going to enjoy today's story. It's different, which you know I always like. With me today is E.M. Lytic. He is the author of All the Memories That Remain. And we're going to talk about his journey with PTSD, his dad's Alzheimer's, talk a little bit about brain stuff, which you know I like. So thanks for joining me, Eric E.M. We were just, we were debating on what to call him before we hit record. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. I appreciate your uh, having me on the show. So I have, out of 300 guests, I have not had a chance to talk to somebody that has dealt with Alzheimer's in the family and their own PTSD. So that was why I was interested in talking to you. But why don't you give the listeners your background, tell us a little bit about your dad, and we'll just jump in from there. Sure. So um, I grew up in central Pennsylvania, and um My parents divorced when I was very young. I was probably six or seven, if I recall at the time. And uh, my father was the primary caregiver. Um, And so I spent much of my life growing up with him. And, you know, that included middle school, high school, middle school, junior high, whatever you want to, however you want to phrase it, um, high school. And then, of course, you know, into my adult years. And, um, my background, you know, I went from high school into the Marine Corps Reserves. I was in the Marine Corps Reserves for a period of time while I went to college. Um, I attended Penn State University, then went to Tulane Law School in New Orleans uh, for three years. And I was in private practice there for a number of years and ultimately decided that um, I still sort of had that itch with the military that had not been scratched. And uh, decided to ultimately leave the firm, um, leave all of the money and fast track the partnership and uh, take a significant pay cut to go back into the military. This time I chose the army. Um, I like to tell people that I wanted to do all the branches before I retired. And I started with the hardest and was working my way to easiest. But um, <clears throat> no, the reality was at the time I was trying to kind of stay at the law firm. Um, so I was looking at the reserves and the Marine Corps, because of how it's structured and kind of their focus on every Marine is, is a rifleman, or in the case of officers, every Marine officer is an infantry officer. Their training pipeline is a, is a year long. And I did not think that I could convince the firm to allow me to go for a year um, to go through this training and then come back. Ultimately, it didn't really matter. I ended up leaving the firm and was in the Army. Um, and served in a lot of different great units. Um, The Army has many of them, just as the other services do. And two of kind of the most storied units that I served with include the 82nd Airborne Division out of Fort now Liberty, North Carolina, and uh, 75th Ranger Regiment, um, otherwise known as the Army Rangers. And in that job, I, you know, deployed several times to Afghanistan, uh, where I advised the commander on the laws of armed conflict, also known as the laws of war, um, in counterterrorism operations. And effectively, what counterterrorism operations boils down to is capture or kill, you know, individuals who are engaged in extremist behavior or terrorist behavior. Um, and so that's sort of my background. I say that's my background, but within the background of that background, you know, I have this this scenario where I have a parent who at the age of 58 was diagnosed with younger onset Alzheimer's and that happened in 2008. So at that time I was with the law firm. Um, and then of course that followed sort of throughout my military career. And I think in large part, I spent many of those years in denial, um, in denial for me. And I suspect for many of your listeners, looks a lot like distraction. Um, And so I spent, you know, that the better part of the next decade um, just distracting myself from sort of what was going on with my father. Um, That ultimately kind of came to a head when I came back from Afghanistan the last time um, was, you know, clearly, it was clear to me that something was wrong in me. Um, I just sort of felt lost and hopeless and you know, there's a, a host of other 
emotions that I was experiencing at the time and started, you know, seeing a therapist there <clears throat> down in Georgia and was ultimately diagnosed with post-traumatic stress. And in trying to come to terms with that and trying to find the way forward, I, I realized that the person that I had most relied on in my life for advice was not there. And so the book is really an out, outgrowth of that, you know, and I, I think that there's a number of different reasons why I wrote it. Um, I think one one reason I re- wrote that I wrote the book is because it was an attempt to sort of revive memories of my father and at the same time rehumanize him in a way. I think there was also a very large impetus in it for me to um, try to help other people. And so I think a lot of times when you are going living with a mental illness of whatever it may be, depression, anxiety, something you know, more serious, post-traumatic stress, et cetera. Um, I don't want to say more serious because that makes it sound like there's a scale and there's not. <clears throat> but when you are living with a mental illness, whatever that may be, there's a lot of times where you feel alone and that nobody else understands. And so in that way, I wanted the book to speak to people for those who are living with mental illness. And I, and I think that the book is universal in that sense. I don't think you need to have experienced war or Alzheimer's to, to take something away from the book, right? I think that if you've experienced any sort of mental illness or trauma or grief, period, I think the book will speak to you in some way. Um, but I wanted people who are reading it, who are living with mental illness, to, to feel seen to feel heard, to know that they're not alone, even when in their darkest moments, they feel alone. And for those who haven't experienced that, who aren't living with mental illness or haven't had sort of trauma or that experience, I wanted them to be able to see what it's like to be living with that, right? And and the book is structured very much in that way in the sense of how it goes back and forth and sort of mimics the process of this healing journey. And so it the book is is really, you know, centered around sort of the question of what would you do if the person that you would normally turn to no longer recognized you? Yeah, most and, of us caregivers have been there. Right. And in essence, um what I've discovered at least for me is that memories are incredibly powerful and memories can both break us and heal us. And so that's what this book is in essence about memories. It makes sense. And it, it seemed like you were working through a lot of that in the book. It's very, it's intense, but it, even I recognize some things. We had some similarities in childhood and I'm older than you. So, um, you know, parenting's changed over the decades. I don't know if <laughs> I don't know if it's better or worse or just different, but it's changed. Um, one of my biggest struggles after losing both parents three years apart is when I look back on my childhood, it's like, so I have a sister who's four and a half years younger and the world kind of revolved around her. She was the one that was more planned. She was a lot like my mother. Just There was just a lot of th- reasons that she was she was the favored one. My mom even told me that. So I look back and it's like, um, I know I had a decent childhood. I had a happy childhood, but I have a really hard time remembering having memories that are specifically just like, oh yeah, that was a really good time. Or that was a really happy day. Or that was a really good holiday or something. There's always some like negative. And I, I, I wonder if I should work with a therapist to work through that because it's really frustrating. It's, it's getting a little bit better, but dang, I'm going to have to, as I tell a lot of my listeners, I plan on living as long as my paternal grandmother who lived to 103. It might take that long for all these positive memories to return. So, I mean, it's incredible how, how powerful the brain is, right? I mean, that there's something to be said about that, you know, to echo your experience. I don't have many memories that I can recall before my parents divorced. That makes and that's, sense. that's a way for your, your brain does that. It blocks those things out. It puts them in the recesses because it's, it's a, it's a way of protecting 
the body, right? Uh, from that, from that experience, whatever it may be. Um, but sometimes that brain fails. Um, and that's kind of what happens with post-traumatic stress. There's a line in the book where I talk about uh, the conundrum that I'm facing, right? When I wish to forget, I can only remember. And when I wish to remember, I can only forget. And, you know, so much of post-traumatic stress is, is this constant reliving, whether it's the emotional reliving in the body or the mental reliving of the experiences that are constantly driving sort of the, the, the flight or fight sort of response. And, you know, the, the, the flashbacks I have are the things that I wish I could forget, but I can't. And then if you ask me other small details about those events themselves, I can't remember them. I can't even necessarily remember the order that these things happen in. And that's because it's your brain is just in a survival mode. It's not in a mode to sort of retain that information that's, you know, that we might otherwise retain in a happy experience. That's, that makes that's sense. My, that's my non, <laughs> non-medical <laughs> explanation uh, for what happens. It makes sense. Um, part of the reason you probably don't remember a lot before your parents divorced is because we don't even generally have a long-term memory until we're about three-ish. So if you were five or six, six or seven, you didn't have a lot of long-term memory prior to that episode. And so- right, but even. Even my three to seven, you know, period of time, I can't really recall much. <clears throat> I don't think I can either. So my sister was born when I was four and a half. I remember moving into the house we grew up in a year before she was born. Like I said, she, my mom wanted kids. I came along. My dad was, he wasn't, um, he didn't plan on that one. With my sister, we had to get a bigger house. So we got a bigger house, then we got her. Um, so there's things that I remember but not a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, from, I don't remember the house we lived in until I was three and a half. Or, yeah. Three and a half. Oh, but that's long-term memory. So yeah. Yeah. The brain is very interesting. I, I say it frequently. If I was half my age with twice the scientific ability, I'd go into brain research because I just, I find it so fascinating and reading your book. It was just like, you know, it was incredible. You had a really rough week ish in Afghanistan where things were not going the way they were supposed to go. And one of the things is that you had a lot of sleep deprivation, which is, we know very bad for our brains. So I don't think that helped at all. <laughs> no, absolutely not. And that sleep de deprivation kind of sort of continues now. Um, I mean, it's still something that I haven't resolved. So that, that doesn't help sort of in the healing process either you know and the the sleep issues are because of the ptsd yeah nightmares oof etc so insomnia that's not cool and the therapists yeah. don't have helps well, for that we can we can talk about the different <laughs> different options for treatment for that but um yeah i mean it's just these are all ongoing battles but i think that the sleep deprivation issue is not uncommon with Alzheimer's patients either. Um, you know, either the medical studies that have shown that uh, poor sleep, inadequate sleep is a early, you know, it can be linked with Alzheimer's, whether it's a direct cause or a contributor is, is kind of the debate, but there's at least a statistical correlation between the develop, development of Alzheimer's. Um, and then even when you have developed, when whomever you're caring for has developed Alzheimer's, um, you, you start experiencing sundown syndrome. Mm -hmm. Your body's clock is just completely off. And so that's another circumstance where you're probably not having proper sleep, proper restful sleep. I, I link sundowners to, you know, they you've been up and doing things for the majority of the day because... They call it sundowners because it generally happens in the late afternoon, early evening, not necessarily around sundown. Although I experienced my biggest sundown syndrome with my mom um, at sundown. <laughs> it was quite a while. We were driving from my house back to hers, um, the back roads through kind of the country. And it was 
December, so it got dark pretty early. So when we started out, it was light-ish, December, daylight kind of, you know, look. And as we drove to her house, which was about a 25-minute drive, it obviously got dark in that amount of time. And oh my God, the, it was like, she asked me if I liked my house. And I said, yes, my house was built in 2007. She said, well, then you should probably pay my grandparents for it. Like, okay, they were dead before I was born. So I don't know how they're connected to this house. I mean, it was just the wildest conversations. I was very stressed out. My dad was on in the hospital. It was just like, it was literally like I had been transported to an alien planet and I had no idea what we were doing. But I think it's a lot, Sundowners is a lot, has a lot to do with just, you know, like at four o'clock, I need a snack. I kind of need to take a little break. It's like my brain needs, you know, it needs different we need to go to the dog park is what we need to do. <laughs> <laughs> we just need to like change the scene. And, you know, it's kind of hard to do. And if, you know, little kids get really cranky and obnoxious at the end of the day, they need a little, you know, quiet time. So that's, that's my non-medical opinion on sundowners. You know, it's like if they've sat around all day, not doing a lot, not having a lot of cognitive stimulation and, you know, they've just gone through the day just the confusion at the end of the day is just terrible. So I'm assuming that's something your dad experienced. It is, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then so one of the things that I um, took away from the book that I was kind of a little bit surprised is how PTSD seems very similar to what we might think of earlier mid-stage Alzheimer's, which I think you've talked about before. Um but did, do you kind of agree with that, that there's kind of some similarities? Like you said, what you want to remember, you can't, and what you want to forget, you can't? Yeah, I think there are some similarities. I think the way I talk about it in the book um, and, the, and the way I would talk about it here would be from the perspective of the, the brain forms such an integral part of who we are, right, as individuals, as persons, as, as the I is the way I think I talk about it in the book. and. Post-traumatic stress, one of one of the experiences, post-traumatic stress and moral injury is the other. Um, I don't want to leave that out because it's important in an area that isn't as well known. <clears throat> so for post-traumatic stress and moral injury, a lot of times you can have this loss of identity of who you were as a person, particularly moral injury when when there's a betrayal of sort of your personally held more, you know, mores. Uh, with Alzheimer's, very similar, you have this loss of identity as you're starting to slowly lose your faculties, as you're starting to slowly lose that ability to have the short-term memories. And um, I, I, to me, that's striking, right? This, this notion of the I, the individual, the identity that we each hold dear being stripped away from us slowly. And the fear that accompanies that, both in Alzheimer's and in post-traumatic stress slash moral injury. Um, and to me, that's striking. And there was, a, you know, to some degree, it gave me some insight into quite possibly the fears that he was facing in those early stages, knowing that he was going to, at some point, have no ability to remember anything, recognize anyone you know, talk, et cetera, and how scary that must have been and how alone he must have felt because it was what made him Ray, right? Um, just as my brain is what makes me Eric. And so <clears throat> that to me is a, a very striking similarity and, and it goes, it boils down to the ability of the brain to remember things, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think we talk about that, what we just said, the identity, the fear, everything we just, you just mentioned. I don't think we talk about that enough as caregivers. I think because it's, it's definitely not the most positive topic, but it's important. Um, you know, it's, we, some people I think rush to, oh my gosh, they have dementia or, or Alzheimer's and you kind of rush to like handle everything. Cause you know, you're going to have to, and a lot of people are like, problem solvers and fixers and that's just their personality and then i think other people 
and I don't say this in a negative way, they kind of cling on to like, this is my mom, this is my grandma, my, my uncle, whatever, whomever they are. And they really hold tight to who they were, which in some respects is probably good because they're trying to do everything to keep that person and their identity. Um, and I think it's easier for some people rather than others. One of the reasons I ended up starting the podcast is because one of the typical bits of advice for people in the later stages is to, you know, simplify the activities that they used to love. Well, my mom was very creative. She painted, she sewed, she did woodworking up until it was no longer safe because of her memory issues. And so creative things, those were kind of easy for me to come up with. And she was always afraid she'd do it wrong, which like drove me bananas. I don't know where that came from. It's not the way she was when I was growing up. Um, so it was, it was really hard. It was like, I had to find, figure out what her new identity was. And we ended up, as most of my listeners know, we ended up basically going to the park and watching children. I make jokes that we like creeped on little kids <laughs> because that's kind of what we did. You know, because she was a mom and a grandmother and that gave her pleasure and it was much easier for me than trying to do all this other stuff that never seemed to work. So it's, I find it interesting, the dichotomy between, you know, rushing to take care of everything and kind of putting them in a corner, maybe a little bubble wrap, which is not good versus, like I said, doing everything you can to keep them the person they were. So it's interesting that you kind of had like an overlapping experience. I don't know if that's the right term, but I know you didn't take care of your dad, but you went and visited him regularly. Um, how that must've been like infinitely harder because you were dealing with such a traumatic issue in your own life. I mean, it's hard enough when life was, life was going fine. And then boom, this happens to people. That's pretty common. Most of us haven't come back from Afghanistan. I, I visited him before, so I, I my my first deployment when I was this is before I was in the seventy fifth Ranger Regiment was in twenty twelve uh, to Afghanistan, and I was you know so that's four years after his diagnosis. I was visiting him, you know, between in those years before my last deployment to Afghanistan, and um, you know you talked about people being sort of a fixer or, or clinging on. I'm more of a fixer. And that was my, that was my approach to things very early on from his diagnosis. And um, what, what I'm realizing now is that in some ways in those early stages, <clears throat> by trying to fix things for him or do things for him, rather than letting him do them himself, no matter how long it took or how much he fumbled through it is that I was robbing him of his agency. And I was making him less of Ray than he already was. And so I think it's an important thing to remember as, you know, and, and God bless caregivers because it's um, primary caregivers because, um, you know, I, I, I think in some way, the, all the family, those who are involved in sort of the, the care of the individual, um, whether it's through visitations or whatnot, yes, may not be the primary caregiver, but we're still caregivers in a sense, right? We're still giving care to the person that we love. Uh, but for primary caregivers, that the the patience that you need to have and and the frustration that I'm sure all of you feel is is a massive struggle. And I don't know how my stepmother did it for all those years before he ended up being in the nursing home uh, because it it had to have been challenging on the best of days. Um, and so it's easy for somebody to say, I, you know, it's easy for me to criticize myself by saying that, you know, I was robbing him of his agency, but I wasn't the one who was having to deal with this day in and day out on a, on a, you know, micro level. And so I, I don't know that that criticism is fair. It's more of a insight that I offer for people to try to help to remember that this is that allow this person to still cling to their identity for as long as they can, uh, because eventually at some point they won't have it. Um, so um, I think 
in the early years before before I came back from Afghanistan that last time visiting him, I think it was always challenging, particularly as the disease progressed. Um, in the early stages, you know, he, he, my dad was um, so a little bit of background about my dad. He had I think that he was a kid in an adult body um, the entire time you know he was alive. He, he you know. I used to ask him all the time as a kid, Dad, what did, what did you want to be when you grew up? And his answer to me without fail every time was, I'll let you know when I grow up. <laughs> and that sort of embodies his personality. He was a clown for the Shrine Circus, so um, he liked to drink quite a bit. Um, there are many stories I've heard about him that I'm shocked that he had not been arrested at some point in time for, you know, the antics that he and his friends pulled, um, you know, not, you know, just juvenile behavior, not sort of anything serious. Um, <clears throat> and so he, he was always sort of a joker and, you know, in the early stages of his Alzheimer's, when you'd see the Lord, the, the little moments where he would slip up, you know, he would sometimes call me my, by my brother's name, or we were at the beach house for, a. Uh, uh, not our beach house. We rent the family rented a beach house um, for Thanksgiving one year, and he just randomly decided to take off his clothes in full view of the family. And um, oh, you know, it's just like you see these sort of breakdowns, and you can't help but laugh at just the ridiculousness of what you're experiencing, what this what this condition does to people, and, and yet it's so sad, right? It's this this tragedy and comedy at the same time, yeah. um, which is just really hard to grapple with i think um so there's you know a lot of a lot of laughter a lot of fun still with him trying to have fun with him and trying to make those memories and and do things that get him out or give him enjoyment uh, but at the same time really struggling with sort of watching this happen to somebody that you love um and when i got back from afghanistan that it was um much harder I think, I think in some ways he became a distraction for me from my own issues. Visiting, him, visiting him, thinking about him, um, allowed me to stop thinking about the things that happened in Afghanistan. Um, no matter what the situation, his condition at that point in time, he hadn't he hadn't been walking for a number of years at that point. He didn't really open his eyes. He never talked. Um, he no longer recognized me. That was all gone, you know, and it was just a shell of a man there. But at least visiting him and thinking about my feelings for him and my memories with him allowed me to avoid, right, which is one of the classic symptoms of post-traumatic stress is avoidance. It allowed me to avoid sort of thinking about the experiences that I had in Afghanistan. And you know, when I was writing the book, the parts that I wrote about him and his experience with Alzheimer's and my observations of his experience um, were infinitely easier to write than anything with Afghanistan. I've told my wife many times now that I feel like scratching below the surface of my experiences in Afghanistan is is the hardest thing that I can do. And, and writing that is just like pulling teeth. So. Um, it, I think in some ways that was my way of avoiding thinking about Afghanistan was to think about his condition. And um, yeah, so I, I don't know that that answers your question without <laughs> me rambling along quite a bit, but um, welcome to the inside of my brain. <laughs> um, well, no, it actually made sense. Um, there was something, well, so you said your dad was kind of always a kid at heart. My parents were all very uptight and, so there was, because my mom didn't recognize me either, um, when you lose 100 pounds, it's not a surprise. I mean, I barely recognized myself when I looked in the mirror. And that made it easier to accept that I'm like, there's no way she recognizes me because, like, it just doesn't even make sense. Mm -hmm. You know, if you hadn't seen somebody for a few years and they've lost over 100 pounds, you might, I had people that were like, oh, my God, that's you. I mean, people that hadn't seen me for a while. So it wasn't a shock when I confirmed that my mom didn't remember that I was her older daughter. 
She thought I was her best friend, so okay, you know, not not such a horrible demotion. Maybe a promotion, kind of <laughs> dependent on the day. She always told everybody, "I've known her forever." It would be like, "Yeah, you think?" You know, <laughs> like, maybe my whole life. <laughs> it's just like you know those kind of moments. The day I was born. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And I would say that, and she would just kind of look at me like, "Well, whatever." But you know, she wanted to sit around and talk, which would have been fine if you could have had a conversation with her. And like I said before. You know, you I could not simplify activities that she would have normally enjoyed because she was always afraid of doing them wrong. So we always had that stiff formality, which I really regret because there was not like, you know, holding of hands. There was no like f intimacy the last three years of her life or even longer, you know, because it was just part of it earlier before my dad died was just it was kind of maybe it was like it was easier to keep her a little bit, not at arm's length, but half an arm's length. Cause it's like, okay, you're very difficult to deal with. I only have a certain amount of time to deal with you. So we, we got to go, we got to take the the route that's going to get this stuff, whatever we need to do, get done. Like my parents' doctor was literally down the hill from my house. So they would come from the doctor's office and my dad who had all kinds of health issues would literally just kind of flop in the chair and just like <laughs> abandon my mother to me, which was fine. But sometimes they'd show up early and I wouldn't be ready. And so it's just, it was hard. Um, but taking her to the park to watch kids or wherever kids, you know, congregated, we'd go to the library in the inclement weather. That was great. But getting her from the car to the bench or wherever, that was awful. Because she walked watching her feet. She walked 10 to 15 feet behind me. Anybody that's listened to enough episodes knows that that was a giant frustration. I would slow down. She would slow down. I would stop. She would stop. She would not walk arm in arm. It, I had a past guest who basically realized my mom was the oldest of four. And that was probably her way of keeping an eye on the kids. I'm like, man, I really wish I'd known that when she was alive. So it's like, it's so hard to, you know, to give them their agency and to be as independent as possible and still maintain your life. And everyone's it's like, oh my God. And, you know, you're visiting your dad in the earlier before the last deployment to Afghanistan. Nobody gives you a roadmap of how to deal with it. Like, don't bubble wrap them and stick them in the corner. That's not good. You know, but don't leave them on there. <laughs> it's just like, that's one of my soapboxes. Stand on the soapbox. We need to educate the entirety of society on what aging is like, what dementias and Alzheimer's is like, because... It's only going to get worse. <laughs> Population is aging. You know, we've had what well, Afghanistan for, you know, the Middle East for 20 years. So we've got people like yourself that, you know, might need a little extra help in their older age. You know, we, we got to we got to get a lot better at taking care of each other. That's that's kind of my political stance is true patriotism is taking care of each other. And then the government can do less because they can just worry about the big stuff. Because we're taking care of our family and our neighbors and our community, and it ripples outward. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. I think what it boils down to is <clears throat> have some, just have some compassion. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just have some compassion for other human beings. 
If they're different from you, have some compassion. If they're the same as you, have some compassion. It's not yeah. hard. You That's know, true. Um, there's a saying, um, there's a, a veterans organization. Um, it's a, a merchandise organization that does a lot of um, fundraising for post-traumatic stress. And they have a t-shirt that says, you know, um, effectively that, you know, everyone has something they're going through that you can't see. Right. Or mm -hmm. we, we don't know when we're talking to someone what they may be going through. So why is it so hard to have some compassion? Just just do it. You know, with my dad and you're right, there's no roadmap with my dad. I guess I kind of adopted the approach of as long as what he's doing is not going to be a harm to himself or others, just kind of let him do it, you know. When I went to visit him and he was at the stage where he didn't really talk at all, all he did was pace the hallway. That's fine. If he wanted to pace, we'll just pace. And when he wanted to sit down, I'd sit down with him. You know, I'd let him decide, you know, to the extent that he could decide that he had willpower, um, what he wanted to do in that moment. And we just did it. And, you know, there were times before he was in the nursing facility when he went out to dinner with us and he wanted to eat something that you would normally eat with a fork. He wanted to eat it with a spoon. And, um, you know, we, you know, there were some people who were like, you know, trying to help him get the fork. And there were others who were just like, let him eat it with a spoon. He's not hurting anymore. Just let him do what he wants. Like, exactly. And so I think that's, I think that's a good approach, right? I mean, again, you're looking out for safety um, of himself and others or herself and others. Um, but otherwise, you're trying to allow an individual to be themselves, to be the human that they want to be, um, because eventually you're going to cross that threshold where they can't make those decisions at all. And you're going to have to make those decisions. And that's the unfortunate reality of this condition. Um, and so I knew that threshold would someday come. And so I tried to just push it off into the future as far as I could. Which that's actually not a horrible plan of attack. Um, I just recently had a guest who's who the way they handled their loved one's journey with the a brain disease was to ask whomever, caregivers, friends, family, doctors, professionals of all sorts, what what might be next? What's coming next? So that they could kind of be like forewarned, they could plan a little bit. Cause I think that's one of the toughest things with any dementia causing disease is you know most of us end up caregivers because of some emergency we we implement some you know um, procedures we make some changes to their life to our life and then okay the emergency is over we think we have it handled okay great and then you know a month or a year later those things don't work anymore and you're like what the hell you know it's just like this was working fine and now what and it's just you're constantly chasing the, the progression and that's yeah. that's hard it's much yeah. better to ask what might I, be next i don't I think don't... that's a bad idea um I, I am certainly a planner at heart me too um, i mean when my when my dad first got the diagnosis the the first thing i did and remember i was at a law firm at the time and I'm, I'm a lawyer by training um the first thing i did was told him and my stepmom you need to go get your wills done if you haven't already or get them updated because at some point you won't have the men mental faculty to make a decision with respect to your will. And if you make a will at that point in time, it's going to be subject to challenge by anyone who knows about your condition and wants to hold this up for whatever reason. Um, so I am a player at heart. I think with that, the, the, the caution I would give is still maintain flexibility, right? Because there's so much, I think we have generic, you know, sort of stages of Alzheimer's, right? There's, I think some people say there's seven, some people say there's four, or I, I may be jumbling that up, but whatever it may be, there, there are a number of stages of Alzheimer's with sort of like what happens in those stages. But every, just as every person is their own person, they're, you know, every person is an individual in healthy times, they're their own individual in sick time as well right and how one person may 
respond during the third stage of Alzheimer's may not be how another person responds during that same stage. So planning is important. It's it's a valued sort of approach uh, just with the, the proviso that just be prepared to be flexible to the extent possible. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I think it this helps. disease teaches flexibility and patience to a great degree. Oh, yeah. I think it beats you over the head with it, whether you want to be patient and <laughs> yeah. flexible or not. <laughs> Most days you don't want to be. It There's just days when you just want to get crap done. Put like, put on your pants. No, I don't yeah. want to take two hours to do this. Just put on your <laughs> pants. Exactly. And with my mom, the more help she needed, the more combative she got. That was fun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, my you father. know. It's it's pretty typical, um, you know, and some of the things I wish I'd known early on. So my mom had lost a tremendous amount of weight. She she had clothes that were like 25 years old, 30 years old. I was like, that woman had so many clothes. She had like literally one huge closet, I think was like at least, I think it was eight feet wide and it was double hung. And then she had the closet that was in my childhood bedroom, which was a standard size closet, which was also double hung. And it was just like, massive overwhelm and she would wear pants that were so big she'd like roll the waistband down four times and they'd still slide down to her hips which of course drove her crazy because she was not the generation that wore the low-rise pants <laughs> um and my dad started you know complaining about the challenges with her clothes and so i think i had him take her out and i i emptied well no i started with her and i i said um I forgot how I conned her into cleaning out her closet, which wasn't easy because she kept saying, well, that's a good knock around the house shirt. That's a good knock around the house shirt. I'm like, mom, you've got 10 blue knock around the house shirts. That doesn't even include the other colors. I was trying to rationalize with somebody who couldn't rationalize. So <laughs> <laughs> what can I think among caregivers, I think. Yeah. Well, it was just, it's like, we are generally rational people, not always, but for the most part. And so after a while, it's, I think your rational brain just starts screaming. It's like, just work with me. <laughs> it's like, I don't think our brain really allows for just the constant, you know, nonsense, which is, which kind of what you get, but it boiled down to that. She got really pissed off that my sister took all these clothes out of her closet, got rid of them. I was like, oh yes. Dementia memory for the win for me. <laughs> I did not get blamed for that one. <laughs> But she still had so many clothes that she literally wore the same things over and over and over because they were accessible. They were easy. They were familiar. And when we moved her into memory care, she literally had like a two foot wide closet, two and a half foot wide closet. And even that had too many clothes in it. So I literally, okay, and I'm in Northern California, so we don't really have seasons like you guys do back there. And I literally had like the warmer weather clothes and the cooler weather clothes, and I would swap them out. So that she just literally had like a week's worth of clothes and uh, it just got so hard. And of course the caregivers in the communities, you know, the memory care communities don't get paid enough. They're not trained enough. There's not enough of them. And so, you know, instead of learning tricks to get them dressed properly in a short amount of time, they just have to get a little physical, which is unfortunate, but I learned too late. If they have an item of clothing they like, buy five of them. This works really good for men. Dad likes jeans, buy five pairs of his favorite jeans. He likes those uh, plaid shirts, but five of those blue plaid shirts he loves. And then he's always got the same outfit, even though it's not the same outfit. I would have loved to have done that with my mother. <laughs> You'd buy her new clothes and she didn't recognize them as hers, so she'd literally give them away. <laughs> It was so much fun. But one of the things that we talked about, we're kind of running a little short on time, is the f wanting your parent to guide you through what challenges you're going through, whether it's your parenting journey or your journey with recovering from PTSD, which sounds like is still ongoing. Um, that's kind of also a big theme in the book is, is your parent is there, but they're not there. Is there a way you kind of coped with that or you just kind of muscled through? The way I coped with? Your dad being around but not being dad? I think the way I coped with that um, was to think about memories. Um, I think ultimately that's what it boiled down to is 
just, you know, the memories of experiences that I had with him or that my brother and I had with him and sharing stories like that and talking about him. That was my way of sort of dealing with his absence. Um, the, the book, uh, a significant part of the book um, deals with his letters to me. So in 2000, when I went through Marine Corps boot camp, my dad, like many dads and many moms throughout the country, wrote me all summer long as I was in boot camp, wrote me letters. And for whatever reason, um, I saved those letters. Um, not only when I left boot camp, I didn't trash them. I brought them home. Um, but then, you know, at that point, you know, eight years had passed when he is diagnosed, when his diagnosis came through and um, I still had the letters. They were at home in Pennsylvania and I picked them up and I kept those letters, you know, through various military moves for the next decade plus. And I started going through those letters again. And I think that's what sort of revived those memories. I talked at the outset about reviving his memories and sort of reviving memories rather of him and, and sort of rehumanizing him. I think the letters were a way of reviving those memories that I had forgotten about. But in the in his letters, he sort of offered the uh, generic fatherly wisdom that we all hear, right, growing up, or we, maybe you hear it from your mother, um, whoever it may be. <clears throat> um, and, there, you know, when I was 18 years old, that was just like pass away, you know, lines, you know, oh, you know, you're in my thoughts or prayers or, um, you know, keep your chin up, right? You know, the, those just cliches or platitudes, right? Right. But <clears throat> as I started going through them, after Afghanistan and sort of with the, with some more experience behind me, um, I started to realize that there were deeper meanings to the things that he was saying in those letters, things that I wouldn't have understood at 18, but that I had a better understanding of now. Um, and that was for me sort of, his advice, how I was able to have a conversation with my dad, even though he couldn't have a conversation with me. I was having it through those letters. And that's sort of what the book is framed around is his letters. And, um, you know, I, I don't know that I've ever come to grips with this very unnatural desire to want your parent to die. And I think a lot of people are afraid to admit that either out loud to others or even to themselves um, because it's so unnatural, right? We don't want our loved ones to die. That's not what we want. But the reality is, is at some point he was already gone. You know, he, he wasn't alive. He was living. Yes, but he wasn't alive. And there's a big difference. And at that point, it was just a desire for his suffering to end, for him, this just laying in bed, effectively comatose, for all of that to end. But that's a mixed bag, right? I, you, you have that desire, but at the same time, you are robbed by this disease of having a parent around when you need them. Whatever the reason, whether it's you and uh, your partner need a date night and you need grandma and grandpa to watch the kids, right? Something physical. Or you have a three-year-old child that is doing X, Y, or Z and you need to talk to mom or dad about what did you do back in your day when I was doing this at age three, you know? Give me some parental guidance, some wisdom here on how I can handle this unruly child, <laughs> right? But they're not there for that. And I think that that's the takeaway, right? What is there is are, are the memories. And I think that a lot of times if we sit with them and think about the memories that we have with our parents or whom our loved ones, whomever it is that's going through this battle with Alzheimer's, they can speak to us in a way that we, they can't in person through those memories. And we can learn a lot if we just sit with them and, and think a bit, sit in that silence and, 
and try to learn from those memories and see what the lesson is that we can take away and apply to this circumstance. And I think that's the the key um, of the book is it's that the memories are so powerful, right? They can both break us and heal us. And that's the essence. Um, I, I do want to say one thing before we close, because I know we're running short on time. Um, um, and now I'm, now I'm blanking on it. Um, I'm having my own. own <laughs> moment. End um, of the day, mind, mind, yeah, mind overload. <laughs> this is the, yeah, it's, I'm, I, this is the sleep deprivation for you. Mm. My stepmother passed last year, um, a day before Thanksgiving. Oof, and so fun. It was it was unexpected, and as we went back, we being my siblings, um, went back to the house to sort of go through and see what was there, and and try to figure out what needed to be done with the house, etc. Um, we were walking around in the different rooms, and and I was struck by something, and what I was struck by was that she had kept all of his clothes. My dad, at that point in time, probably had not moved from his bed, from the nursing home bed, in five years, at least, um, if not longer. Um, And it struck me because it was as though she believed that he could come home at any moment. And I think that it's tragic. It must be an experience that most primary caregivers have at some point in time, right? That that hope beyond hope, that belief just in the back of your mind, just that tiny little piece, maybe something will change. Maybe they'll come home. And at this point in time, without more research, I I think that's where we're at, unfortunately, is that that's not going to happen. Um, Hopefully... Mm -hmm. Hopefully in the future, we get to a point where this is a disease that can be cured or, you know. Prevented. Yeah. Um, but we're not there. And no. the reality is, is that he was never coming home. And, but she kept the, all of his clothes as though he were. And I think that's, it just broke my heart because I am sure there are times where she wanted to wring his neck. <laughs> right? To use a phrase that my parents would use growing up. But at the same time, there was that love there that, that sort of never died. And that longing and yearning for someone that was there, you know, at the end of your own life and who wasn't there anymore and you wanting to hold on to that. And, and I, I guess my point to caregivers is, I see that pain. I hear that pain, but don't go it alone because you're not alone. There are others out there who have experienced the same thing, who know what you're experiencing and who can be there with you through that pain. Yeah. I, I experienced like the flip side of that coin. So my dad passed away because my mom had bounced from my sister's house to my house, to her home where her younger sister took care of her first off bouncing them around is not good. It was absolutely clear. She did not respect me as an adult that was in charge of my own house. So I knew very clearly that after a week of living with me, one or both of us would be dead. I knew that was not, it was not an option. So my, my died March 2nd. My mom moved into memory care March 16th. That felt terrible. And we had to clean out their house so we could rent it. And you're getting rid of all of these things, all of these m- physical items that have memories attached to them. And, you know, you don't forget the memories just because you get rid of the stuff. Um, that was hard. And then when she died and we moved her to memory care, she had way less stuff. And then when she died, you know, like the photographs are on the wall. Everybody had their own version. Um, the clothing... They dispersed to other residents. Um, she had a, a chair, a day bed, and um, she had a console table that her dad built. I have that. But everything else was just like, you know, you just get rid of it. And it just, it feels like you're 
getting rid of them. So that's probably why your stepmom didn't get rid of his clothes because it was like getting rid of him. Yep. I think that's fair. But I loved what you said about sitting with them and just thinking about memories. And I'm, I'm sitting here wishing I had heard that, you know, seven or eight years ago because, you know, it just, I, I'm sitting here thinking about the times we would sit in mom's room and, and she would ramble on about weird stuff. And it was just, I desperately tried to figure out what she was trying to tell me. So I was like in that fixer mode and it would have just been better to do something different. So I love what you said about just sitting there and thinking about memories as a way of letting them communicate to you. That's beautiful. And that's what I would like for the caregivers to really take to heart from this conversation, because I think that might actually really help. Might've helped me with the childhood memories that I'm struggling to find the positive ones. So that, that's, I think that's perfection. It, that little nugget of advice is perfection. Thank you. <laughs> I, will, I will consider my day complete now. <laughs> well, good. So before I let you go, how are you doing right now? Every day is a challenge. Um, some, day, some days are good. Most days are not. Um, but, you know, it is a process to continue working through. I think the important thing, um, and I think this is another another saying that could equally apply to Alzheimer's and, and the process of Alzheimer's is healing or, you know, sort of coming to terms with the new normal is not a linear process. Nope. It's not a A to Z. It is a A to five to, you know, S to nine to two to et cetera. Right. It's just all over the place. And I think that's, um, something to always keep in mind there there are steps forward and 10 steps back and six steps to the side and then you know another step forward and and that's sort of the process and i haven't given up on it um it's a long process i think but um, i'm lucky to have um a very supportive wife and and very supportive family um around me as i go through it well I hope the healing happens sooner rather than later. I am sorry that international law was your passion and it sent you to Afghanistan to do things that none of us had actually been aware of until I read your book and, and met you. So I don't want to say thank you for your service. I know that's not necessarily like the best term, but I don't know what else to say. So my dad was a Marine for four years. So is it Semper Booyah? Semper Fi. Ura. Semper Fi. Ura, yeah. Ura, okay. It's it's been a while since I've been around his friends that were also Marines. So. <laughs> yeah, well, you can tell them apart from everyone, right? I can still mm -hmm. tell Marines from the group. Once a Marine, always a Marine. That's right. Yep. Even if you decided to be a Army Ranger later on, <laughs> I'm sure I know that a lot of my Marine friends gave me grief when I when I went to the Army. So um, it's part of that brotherhood and sisterhood, right? Uh, that you just want to beat up on your siblings and the branches are all siblings. So but that's, that makes part, sense. that's part of it. And that's what, that's, what's the, uh, shows the love. Right? That's yeah. The show love. <laughs> so well, that's a wonderful place to end. I appreciate you. I appreciate the book. I hope other people will read it because there's a lot of stuff that resonates, I think with all of us, at least it did with me. So, and I know my husband didn't read it. He's not a reader, but I'm sure there's, there was things in there that you wrote about that would have resonated with him as well. So it's definitely um, an intense read, but it's a really, it's still a beautiful read. Thank you. I appreciate it. And thanks so much for having me on, Jen. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>